very similar. Okay. All right. Item number 13. Stage two drought update. All right. Mr. Hagmark. Hello again. Good to see you. There's a hurricane down yeah. south. <laughs> we want it. I know. It's not coming up here. Madam Mayor, Council Members, my name is Joshua Hagmark. I'm the Acting Water Resources Manager. I'm here today to give another Stage 2 drought update. I have with me today Kelly Dyer, our Water Resources uh, Supervisor, who oversees supply, and uh, Madeline Ward, our Conservation Coordinator, to help out with the presentation today. I have a lot of items to go over today. I apologize for the length, but I have received quite a few questions from the Council and they're just trying to answer as many as I can in the presentation today. But, of course, if I miss something, please stop me. I'd be happy to go back. But we'll be talking, of course, about water supply outlook, uh, where we are with our supplemental water purchases, um, how we take delivery of those uh, supplemental water purchases through the Cal uh, Central Coast Water Authority, our drought response capital projects, uh, where we are with water conservation efforts, and tools for influencing water usage. So I'm going to spend a little more time this, this go around talking about our current supply strategy. It is our roadmap for how we have been approaching this drought and how we are dealing with <clears throat> the variable conditions that exist. And I just kind of want to walk through the, the different elements of this, this graphic here. We are currently in year three. That's water year three, which is 2014. This is the last month of this water year. And then we will start water year four. Uh, as you can see, we have a very diverse portfolio of water. Um, extraordinary conservation being our cheapest source of water in a drought to help combat the drought. It doesn't, we can't end the drought with our conservation efforts, but we certainly can do a lot to extend our other water supplies. Um, in year three, we also have supplemental water, which we have imported this year to help meet our demands. We have groundwater, which we are ramping up the usage of. Um, we'll be using a lot more groundwater next year. The state water, uh, as, you, as you know, the state water for this year um, was reduced to 5%, and we have this uh, often confusing. This state water that shows up on here is water that we had banked uh, outside of the area and had delivered and used this year. So it was state water from prior years that we had been kind of storing up exactly for the lack of rainy day um, and delivered it and utilized this year. We have water in Gibraltar and Mission Tunnel that we are utilizing, and we anticipate towards by December, if we don't receive any significant rainfall and runoff, Gibraltar will be empty. And so when you look out in future years, the, the inflow coming in is actually just Mission Tunnel, water coming in from Mission Tunnel. Um, Kachuma carryover water, this is water in, from prior years that we have not utilized our full allocation and have kind of stored up as kind of a bank, and that's how we are planning to spread it out and deliver it to help meet our needs. And then, of course, uh, looking at year four, the dwindling supply in Kachuma, we are taking a 55% reduction, and I will talk about that a little further into our presentation. Uh, I think it's also important to know as, as part of our supply strategy, this assumes no reservoir inflow and no additional state water. The, we will be pursuing additional purchases, but we don't are anticipating any state water allocations going forward as part of this plan. So I'm very pleased to uh, report to the community that our conservation efforts for August were 25% reduction from normalized use. And that is a huge, uh, huge step forward. Whatever people are doing, keep doing it. We're headed in the right direction. We need to see those kind of conservations, particularly in the warmer months when a lot of outdoor discretionary water use is occurring. It's going to become more difficult as we move into the winter months, and it becomes that that reduction is going to need to come from indoor water usage. Um, I am pulling together some numbers and hope to report back, but we've seen some significant drop-off in <clears throat> water coming into the wastewater treatment plant, which indicates in, indoor water usage. So... Um, Anyway, to kind of back up and look at the map or the, the uh, graphic here, the 
dotted green line is our normalized water usage. That's what we would anticipate to see in a normalized year. We have the actual water usage, the red bar, which is showing the 20 the 20% and 25% reduction. We have the drought target, which is the 20% overall target that we're looking for for the year. And we also have the water year 2013. And now water year 2013, as you recall, was the driest year on record. So that's why we put it on here for kind of some level of comparison, but our conservation efforts that we're looking for are 20% below a normalized usage. For um, kind of wanted to look at who was saving water. I thought this would be a helpful discussion. Now this is for the month of July. And what we saw was basically every category of water user was conserving. And I think doing a, a significant portion of, of saving in all areas. What we would expect to see though is uh, single family residential, uh, recycled water, irrigation customers doing the bulk of the conservation, and that's where we, we saw that. That's outdoor discretionary water usage. And so we saw um, an average probably in there about 30% reduction from that category alone. The uh, manu uh, multi multifamily residential and commercial industrial, a little more hardened water use, not a lot of outdoor, uh, you know, discretionary water. Um, and there we saw an 18%, which was very impressive from that, that category. That includes restaurants and businesses. And that was a very impressive number. And then I, I do want to talk a little bit about agriculture. 11%, I took that. that was a, that's an impressive number. Again, ag does not make up a significant amount of water in this community. But uh, the way water is allocated to agriculture is based on weather and the crop that they're actually growing. To, so to see 11% reduction is pretty impressive um, because that does does mean a drop in yields if they go too far with that. And so overall, um, a great picture that this community in all categories is pulling their weight and very pleased if this can continue. So where are we with total water savings? <clears throat> We've been reporting since June now on water savings. And uh, as you can see in August, we saved just shy of 400 acre feet we are about 300 acre feet shy of our 1,200 acre foot goal uh, for the end of this water year. And I think it's very feasible in September that we can achieve that goal. Certainly this warm spell is not helping, uh, but um, I think if we can hit the 20 to 25% goal, we certainly can achieve that for this, for this water year. <clears throat> now, there has been a lot of questions about what the status of Lake Kachuma is, so I just wanted to take and spend a little time on that. There is currently uh, 62,300 acre feet of storage remaining in Kachuma. Its overall capacity when full is 200,000 acre feet. Uh, we did not have solid numbers for what, how, the amount of project water. The county is currently working on this and anticipates publishing something in early October, but it's somewhere between 25 and 30,000 acre feet is currently available to the project participants and I'll spend a little time on that. Uh, the project participants being uh, the member units such as Montecito, Carpinteria, City of Santa Barbara, Galena, and San Ynez. We are all part of the participants of, of the uh, Kachuma project. And that is the available water we anticipate as of October 1st. Um, for next year, we anticipate bringing in about 6,000 acre feet uh, for the city in water year um, 15. We have some carryover of 1,975 acre feet that we plan on bringing. We have the 3,725 acre feet, which is our entitlement of Kachuma water. That's a 55% reduction from normal. And again, that was mutually agreed upon reduction by all the member units that we would take uh, to make sure that um, Kachuma could continue to provide uh, water past this water year. I'll talk about that in next slide. Uh, and then there's uh, 300 acre feet in which Montecito Water District, we have a, an ongoing agreement with them uh, that they, they do an exchange. So as I mentioned, uh, all the member units are taking a 55% reduction in their water usage for water year 15. Now that is, there has to be mutual agreement if we want to change that. So should this year become 
Uh, we received significant inflow. We've all agreed that we would want to revisit this and take a look at that because the reduction is pretty, pretty steep. Uh, the strategy here is to try, uh, Kachuma plays an interesting role in our state water deliveries. We need water in Kachuma in order to convey it through and into the south coast the Tekalodi tunnel to move it to the south coast. And so part of maintaining some water in Kachuma is so we can continue to purchase water and import water. Um, also, we want to maximize our opportunity at one more water year, one more winter of rainfall in the hopes of, of getting some inflow into the reservoir. Like I reported last time, um, there is at 30,000 acre feet of capacity in Kachuma, there is a, uh, the ability, according to our biological opinion, that we could reduce the amount of fish releases. Uh, currently, it's about 10 acre feet a day that is released for fish, and the biological opinion uh, leaves it open that it could be reduced down to one acre foot. That discussion is occurring. We are not allowed to be at the table during that discussion, but the Bureau and National Marine Fish Fisheries are actually in discussions, consultation right now, on what, if any, reduction we can get that down to to extend the life of the reservoir. Now, there is a uh, release going on currently. It started on August 18th and is anticipated to go through August 31st. The upside to that release, uh, that is water that does belong to the downstream users. They're releasing about 4,500 acre feet of water. And when that release is occurring, we do not have to uh, release project water for the fish because that water um, also satisfies the, the fish, fish need. So for the time being, which will add up to uh, at least 60 days, there's some uh, significant 600 acre feet of water saved by the downstream users doing this release. So there also was some questions about how uh, the delivery process works through the Central Coast Water Authority. Um, the city's Table A, and I apologize for the acronyms in here, the Table A is our contract with the state water contract is for 3,000 acre feet of water per year. And um, in a normal year, that's what our allocation would be. We're supposed to get those requests in by October 1st. CCWA is kind of lagging a couple weeks behind, but we're putting that request together <clears throat> to them, and they'll be basically looking at what other communities' requests are. Some may not have the water to fill their, their allotment in the pipeline, and if they can't fulfill it, then that extra capacity becomes available to the other users. Um, that... Uh, by December 15th, the goal is to kind of figure out what that reserve capacity is and who's interested in that reserve capacity. So we will be moving forward to a request at least our 3,000 acre foot capacity and also any interest in, we'll be showing an interest in any unused capacity. The, uh, we have budgeted sufficient uh, funds for this year to include more than 3,000 acre feet of capacity should we be able to find additional supplemental water to deliver. Um, again, if there's any unused capacity going forward and we do find water, uh, we, we can certainly request to use that. So for this next year on our, our supply charts, we show 1,900 acre feet of required uh, supplemental water. We currently have that water. It's in San Luis Reservoir, and it will be delivered over the next couple months and into the, the new year. <clears throat> what I'm showing is secured right now is water that we've purchased from Vandenberg Air Force Base. It's, it resides in San Luis Reservoir. Uh, we have purchased 535 acre feet from the Mojave Water Agency, which sits in San Luis Reservoir. And uh, Biggs West Gridley was a purchase of water from rice farmers in Northern California. That water is being delivered as part of a larger movement of water that started in July and will end in September. I put a little asterisk by it because the actual final quantity is unknown. We assumed a 35% loss of water. We purchased actually 2,000 acre feet and there are normally losses when you move water through the delta associated with environmental concerns up there. And we assumed a 35% carriage loss. That doesn't get established or published until probably November by the Department of Water Resources. So um, at this point, I have no reason to believe we won't see most of that. 
Um, so I'm showing that as secured at this point. Uh, I think we will uh, we'll know shortly what that looks like, but I haven't heard any negative feed like back that they've had to turn off the pumps and, and uh, we certainly would not be seeing a portion of that. Then under the unsecured, I uh, kind of want to take a little time to talk about this. It's been a while since we went into detail, but the city is participating in a groundwater banking program. It's uh, in, D in Kern County called Dudley Ridge. Uh, we have stored water there and in essence, it belongs to the city. It's just a matter of scheduling its delivery and the cost of that delivery. Certainly, there's a lot of people trying to move water around and to get water out of that bank. Because we had already had so much water already lined up to be delivered in San Luis Reservoir, I didn't push hard to get it delivered this year. But in, F in water year 15, we certainly will be looking to try and get the remainder of that 1,400 acre feet that we own there delivered. That brings us up to a total. This, this is a long presentation, so I want to ask a question now here. How much is of this loss is due to evaporation? Do we know? The 35 percent you mentioned before. The the thirty five percent carriage loss that yeah. Department of Water Resources refers to is related to um, mitigation for moving water through the delta, and it has to do with saltwater intrusion. It has to do with. Um, uh, uh, fish in the delta sometimes they have to throttle the pumps back and so they can't get they can't move a hundred percent of the water through the delta and so that's what that it's not really an evaporative loss necessarily I see it's more of a um, an environmental mitigation when we get to something where you could express what evaporation really costs us could you let me know you know what percent how, how we would figure that out okay D don't stop now okay. <laughs> Okay. So total supplemental water at this point that I feel um, we've kind of got our hands around is around 4,400 acre feet. So what our current philosophy is, is to maximize the available capacity in calendar year 14. We have or will have delivered by December 3,759 acre feet of water, which is well beyond our normal year capacity in the pipeline. So we've taken up extra capacity to deliver more water. Um, we have 19, we will have 1,900 acre feet of water remaining to be delivered in calendar year 15. And I, I do apologize, but there's all these different, there's the water year calendar, there's the fiscal year calendar, and then there's the regular calendar. Um, the 1,900 acre feet uh, we will have in San Luis. Now, that does not include the Dudley Ridge water, but that's how much water we will have remaining to be delivered in calendar year 15. We an anticipate having 3,300 acre feet of capacity in the pipeline. Um, and we have, like I mentioned, budgeted to deliver up to 4,500 acre feet if we can get additional capacity and we can find additional water to deliver. We're certainly looking... Um, to see what's out there. The water market right now is very quiet. It typically is this time of year, but it will start to pick up in the next couple months. The major chunks of water start to move around once they start to know what the rainfall totals start to look like. Uh, it's kind of like last, last year, it was a frenzy. Um, February, March, April, May, and then June, it started to quiet down as far as water available for sale. So uh, according to our current supply strategy, uh, we are looking for 4,420 acre feet from now through year six. Now, it's conservative. At this point, I feel like we've got a good handle on that volume of water. Certainly, if I can find additional water, it provides us additional breathing room. There are certain capacity limitations with how much we can import. But if we can buy additional water, uh, should we have issues with meeting our conservation goals? Should we have issues with our wells? It could provide us that uh, safety comfort level moving forward as we continue to uh, adaptively manage the drought. Now at this time, I'm gonna jump into the, our capital projects. We have, uh, the tertiary treatment plant is currently in construction and is anticipated to be online by the summer of 2015. Um, Along with that, we continue to work on the Valverde well 
This is a non-potable well. We have been looking to get online to help uh, with the recycled water system to reduce potable water demand. And to prove the, uh, we're moving on the tertiary project, I'm gonna continue to bring you monthly pictures <laughs> to show the construction. At this point, we're pretty much out of the ground, which is probably the most risky part of construction. And uh, the filters have been ordered. Um, and so, uh, as you may recall, we do have a incentive clause in this contract to encourage the contractor to finish early. And should he, there is a financial incentive for that. Groundwater project highlights uh, Alameda well replacement. As you may recall, that well uh, um, failed, and we are currently in design for replacement of that well in Alameda Park, and it's scheduled to be online in the summer of 2015. High school well, we've done some water quality testing on it, and it appears that we're going to need to pipe that to the Ortega groundwater treatment plant if we intend to have use that as a long-term source for the drought, and so we are working on a pipeline design right now, and we have budgeted money, to, it's about three quarters of a million dollars to run the additional piping down to tie into the Ortega groundwater treatment plant. The Veracruz well, uh, as you may recall from last month, we had an electric failure. We did an emergency purchase order. That equipment has arrived, and staff are installing that now, and we anticipate to be operational there uh, by October. And the city hall well, as you've been inconvenienced by that, lots of equipment out there, that well is actually under warranty, and the contractor is out under their own cost um, trying to get to the bottom of the well and retrieve the motor and pump which failed, pull it out, and we have already purchased additional pump to go back down there so we can get that operational hopefully as soon as possible. We're hoping by October. So as I plan to go into great detail uh, next week on desal, I'm just going to quickly move through this. We are currently in the pre-design phase. We are currently preparing for award of a contract for design build in uh, April of 2015. That would put the facility online in uh, the summer of 2016 in the hopes of meeting the critical demand in 2017. Now what this graphic does show, and I want to clarify is, the this shows a facility of 7,500 acre feet, but we are going to do this in phases. The initial award will be for a much smaller facility, and should the drought continue and conditions remain, uh, we will be prepared to expand that facility if necessary. It uh, The elements that we have kind of left there are module elements, treatment treatment trains is what they're called, that can expand the, the size of the facility up to the 7,500 acre feet. A question. Um, it's based on no reservoir inflow. So does that mean zero rain from today forward? I mean, or is it some, I mean, if it rained a little, a lot, average rain, how, how does that change at all? So, so Madam Mayor, what's, what's challenging about this is we could receive rain but not receive any inflow. What we really need is the inflow to make a difference here. We can receive five or six inches. It depends on how it falls. If it's just a steady rain, the, the watershed right now is extremely dry. The county is saying 13 inches of rain to just to start to see any runoff. Now, again, that's all prefaced with how that rainfall comes in, but basically what we're really focused it doesn't mean no rain it just means we we need to see inflow we're assuming no significant inflow last year we received no significant inflow into kachuma and so if we had a typical average rain year um we would still have an issue with the drought because we are so far behind in terms of, is is that an accurate statement that is accurate we we would be really challenged even in a normal year we would see some inflow but i don't know that it it will be, that's a part of the adaptive management we will have to see, and, and hopefully it will be enough to, to delay the desal decision, uh, but it's going to be, we're going to have to be checking it monthly and seeing what that means, um, because I don't think a normal year is going to, to delay it, but I certainly hope it does. Okay. Did you want to add anything? No. You're good. Okay, thank you. And just quickly through the desal project milestones, September 23rd, uh, preliminary design 
uh, findings with recommendations. Uh, part of those recommendations will to be to be to release an RFP, which is a request for proposals for design, build, operate services. Um, we hope to receive those in February, and be ready for council to consider award pending award, pending water supply status, and that would put us online sometime in summer of 2016. Uh, just to kind of highlight what we'll be discussing next week. We intend to go through the status of the study phase and all the information that was gathered. It's a pretty uh, intensive effort of putting together all the information about what our existing facility can and can't do and what needs to be done to bring it back online. Uh, also, a in-depth summary of our permits and where we stand with our permits. We'll be reviewing the costs that we anticipate uh, for restarting the facility and operating it and uh, looking at the different funding options that are available. The comb pumping project, as you may recall, there is a, the lake level is getting to the point uh, where we're no longer going to be able to gravity feed water to the south coast. Um, comb, Kachuma Operation and Management Board has been actively working on getting this pumping project in place. And as the, of the end of August, the pumping project is now in place and operational and is in standby mode. That cost for that project was about six, a little over six million dollars. The city's share was 2.2 million. Um, we're very optimistic. We've been working on several grants. One of them is a $500,000 grant from the State Water Resources Control Board that would go directly towards the city's cost, and then a larger grant uh, issued through the Department of Water Resources uh, for a for a $2 million grant for the entire project, which should be shared by all the participants. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Madeline Ward. Madam Mayor, members of the council, my name is Madeline Ward. I'm the Acting Water Conservation Coordinator, and I will be going over a few highlights of the conservation program. As you can see, the Smart Landscape Rebate Program has really taken off. Um, we've quadrupled the amount of pre-inspections we did this year compared to last year. So there's very high interest in the program. People are not only calling us to get recommendations on how to cut back inside, but also outside and are taking action, not just thinking about it. We're very pleased to see that. The um, maximum still remains $1,000, and the average is about $700. We have quite a few people that um, just make small changes. Maybe they don't even have a lawn to begin with, but it could be something as simple as replacing pop-up sprinklers with drip systems. Um, not a lot of the irrigation retrofits are expensive at all. There's really simple changes that people are making, and we're um, happy to encourage them to do that. Also, it's been expanded to include pool covers. That's been a great program um, since they are now required as of May 20th. It's an extra incentive for those that don't have a pool cover right now to um, get a little money back when they cover it. Some are going with the, the basic light bubble wrap covers. Some have the very hard mechanical covers. Um, it's up to them what they want to do. Uh, and then they just take a picture of it and submit the application to us. It's a really simple process. And hopefully you've been seeing our ads around town. We try to be everywhere that we can possibly be. Um, we have different examples up on the screen of a television ad, print ad, online ad, and also social media. We are lucky in that we have a great coordination program countywide where we all work together on advertising. So we have similar messages, similar branding. Of course, there's people that live in Santa Barbara, work in Goleta, et cetera, and they see these wherever they are. Um, we're all in this together, as we like to say, so we, we help each other out and um, are on different platforms. Uh, the county water agency has been helping with some of the social media um, uh, ads that they've been doing, and we've been glad to be a part of that program. We also have a new WaterWise Citizen Spotlight. We always like to promote where you want to go. So we have wonderful people in our community that are cutting back. As you can see, uh, overall, we're doing great with the 20% and the 25%. So we really want to highlight those individuals or businesses that are um, really being an example for the community of how they're cutting back. And we have a lot of people that have 
uh, approached us or we've met them via a water checkup and they're great candidates for this. So we're planning to release one a month and uh, do it via bill insert, social media, et cetera, to just celebrate these people who are just average citizens in our community that are really doing the right thing. And we're always looking for more, so you can always send them our way um, and we can snap a few pictures and do a quick interview. Just an update on waste of water enforcement. We can tell that the community is very responsive. We have a lot of calls or reports online for our online reporting form. Uh, so far, we've had about 624 complaints logged in our database. 246 of those have been resolved. What we call resolved is that we've had an ongoing dialogue with the property owner, whether it's a home or a business, and it's generally something that's been repaired. Um, and then we've had about 281 of no further occurrence. So we had the initial contact with them. We've come by and it's been, uh, we haven't seen it again. So we haven't gotten confirmation from anyone that they fix something. Generally, it's a behavior actually. It's not using a shut off nozzle or not watering during the correct times. And we don't have a further occurrence that we visually see or it's not reported back to us. We have about 50 ongoing cases. Um, these are the newer ones that we uh, are still within the week period before we follow up with them or before we've heard back from them. And then we do have quite a few that are insufficient information, especially the ones with the online form where it just gives, uh, it doesn't give an address and says the corner of this and this, there's a puddle of water. And it's hard for us to determine where it comes from or if there aren't any pictures or there's no clear violation. It just says waste of water on this corner. Uh, so if we get further information, then we'll be able to follow up. But there's a few out there that are just um, not quite all the information. Um, Luckily, we've only had to do 10 notices of violation. That's the first letter, so it's still a warning. There's no fine for that. And as you can see, we have not had to give out any fines for anyone. They've all been corrected at this point. We tried to approach it as education rather than strict enforcement because a lot of these cases, people are unaware that their sprinklers are broken or spraying into the road. So that's the best thing. And we actually get some of these people that go through the rebate program, which is a win-win for everyone. Um, also, when we come back in October for the October drought update, we'll be bringing back the discussion that we had, I believe, in April about um, the short-term effects of increasing the water conservation budget during the drought. Uh, we did this analysis a few months ago, but we've had some increased uh, information uh, from the public and the media asking about it, so we want to bring it back and just refresh everyone's memory about the the model and the analysis that we did on that. Mr. Hart has a question. Just while you're preparing that part of the presentation, if you could talk about the history of water conservation, you know, go back to the previous drought, because I think people um, forget that there was tremendous infrastructure investment by local homeowners in low flow toilets and low flow showers, you know, the first time that we had this occur. And so that the baseline when we compare community to community in terms of water conservation can can be very different. And, and so I think it'd be helpful to have some real context about that. And it might not have been what you were thinking about presenting, but I think it would add to, to what the public needs to understand about what we're doing now versus what has already occurred and, you know, put that in context. So thank you. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> As you can imagine with the drought, we have um, have increased our resources, labor resources, to try and be responsive to all the complaints and questions coming in and all the uh, water checkups that we provide. We have been doing that with hourlies. And again, we had to budget, put this budget together uh, in the middle of last winter. And at this time, if we want to continue with those resources uh, past December, we, we do need uh, to increase our, our budget by about 225000 to continue with those staffing resources. What we'd like to do, because of the way our, our hourly system works, it's up to 1,000 hours. Those employees, we'd have to let them go and hire new employees. Well, we've got these staff all trained. They're all knowledgeable about the, the current drought and about what homeowners and stuff need to do. That we are recommending that we, we, um, we modify the position control resolution 
to include uh, permanent employees on a defined period. And so what we would do is be recommending uh, employment through June 30th, 2015. And then should drought conditions continue, we'd, we'd want to extend that employment. But they've been really incredible. I, I don't know how else we could meet the demands. We've been trying to keep those checkups to um, no more than three weeks out and uh, trying to be responsive following up on the 600 complaints. There's just a, a, lot of, a lot of work to be done there, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of community who has questions. I mean, a lot of time spent on the phone just answering questions about what does this mean on my bill and how do I, how do I handle this? And, you know, our, our typical staffing is pretty lean and mean to start with. So uh, this additional staffing has been incredible, and it's, it's important that as part of the recommendation today we, we, uh, we can move this money from the... Um, water fund reserves to the drought fund to continue. Madam Mayor, Council Members, my name is Kelly Dyer. I'm the Water Resources Supervisor. And before I go on to the next um, part of the presentation, I did want to go back to the question on evaporation just to um, put it in perspective. Um, the evaporation in Kachuma in 2013 was a uh, around 9,000 acre feet. So it's more than the city's entitlement, which is 8277. Uh, just to give you a sense a of. Percent wise, what does that mean? To, I mean, how do we figure? Uh, so our, the, the annual entitlement to all member units is about 25,000. So in one year, it's. Like 30%, then? Right. Oh. Uh, well, I'm here today to talk about uh, tools for influencing water usage. And so the city has a adopted water shortage contingency plan, which outlines the framework for responding to water shortage conditions, um, including uh, demand management measures, particularly during drought. And so we are currently in stage two uh, of the three drought stages that are defined in our plan. And we have implemented our conservation-based drought water rates, uh, which incentivize the 20% required demand reduction. And we've also implemented regulations uh, that have mandatory restrictions on water use. Council asked that we look into uh, the legal requirements for implementing financial penalties, additional financial penalties for high water use. And I just want to take a moment to describe the difference between penalties and rationing. As I understand, penalties is um, a financial penalty that would be applied for relatively high water use within a customer class. And um, whenever that allotment would uh, be exceeded, it would be a financial penalty and an ongoing financial penalty with rationing that would um, look at a water short, how much water we have available, determine the priority of how water should be used um, during a shortage, and allocate each customer with a certain amount uh, that they can use. And if they go over that amount, subsequent violations would uh, result in a floor restrictor or potential termination of service. So that's the difference, uh, as I understand, and want to make sure that we've framed the question correctly, um, that council was interested in understanding the legal requirements for the financial penalties. And um, in our research, we found that they can be implemented under our Municipal Code Title 14, it would be under the uh, um, regulations during water shortage conditions. We would need to do some quantitative reasoning to outline the rationale for the level of the water use resulting in penalty and adopt a resolution defining um, that water allotment and revise the Municipal Code because it currently states the uh, um, Floor restrictor and termination of service for under that section of the code. And in our re research, we did talk with the city of Santa Cruz staff, who is currently implementing the the strictest rationing plan in the state. I um, and I wanted to share with you what what we learned and um, 
learned from them. They were very helpful in, you know, describing the process of, of developing their rationing plan. And um, it would require technical analysis and policy. It would have to be a public process to, you know, um, determine the policies for setting um, the priorities of water use, whether that's public health and safety, business, irrigation, and then determining how much of each of our customer classes could have for those uses. Um, we'd have to bump, modify our billing system to impose the penalties once people exceeded their allotment, uh, do public outreach so people understood uh, what was coming and understood how much water they were uh, had available to them. And it, um, in our discussions, uh, we found that it would probably take around nine to 12 months to develop the plan and, and implement it within our system. So uh, we would likely need to hire more staff um, to develop it and uh, would also prepare an ordinance and, and an appeal process for, for such a plan. Currently, we are working on stage three water rates. It's um, drought water rates that incorporate the cost of desalination and other drought-related costs. And the result of that study will be higher financial penalties for, for water use. And so we're recommending that currently we, we, go, uh, we continue with our current plan, um, which includes... Uh, increased drought water rates um, with stage three, as well as potential additional regulations on water use applications. And I guess, it, do you want to, are you done? Are we, okay, vision for wetter tomorrow, I always like that. Um, so okay, we'll go to questions and then we do have some public comment speaker slips, Mr. White. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, if we, we're going to go to questions now. Perhaps we should have public comment, and then we will have our, our comments sure. you, ourselves. Are there any so questions? I'll just so wait on that. Okay. Any questions? Mr. Rouse? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Hagmark, you mentioned the uh, incentives for the tertiary treatment plant construction. Are there penalties or liquidated damages if they, if they run over on the other side? Madam Mayor, Council Member Rouse, uh, yes, there are penalties, pretty heavy penalties. I remember right, somewhere... Uh, above $2,000 a day for delays beyond the, the uh, completion date. Right. And you also mentioned uh, for the construction of the desal plant uh, that our initial phase would be for the, the 3,000 or whatever the, the acre feet would be. Um, were there a, uh, an adjacent or a partnering agency involved? Could that potentially be ramped up if some agreement could be reached ahead of time? If a neighboring agency, for example, wanted to participate in some way or another, just theoretically. Uh, and I mean, is it a financial issue as opposed to an actual structural phased-in issue is, I guess, my question. The approach that we're currently taking is to minimize the, the exposure to the city as far as oversizing the facility. Right. But the a partnering uh, idea that we were planning to talk a little about that next week uh, – is complicated because of the permits that we currently have. We're not clear that there, that that is an option yet, but that's something we haven't fully vetted. But that's one of the things we, um, at this point, we feel we are on um, solid ground with our own permits to reactivate the city for this community. Thank you. Ms. Maria? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Council Member Hart has been referring to droughts of the past and so in terms of a rationing plan we we don't have anything on the books and i got a little panicky looking at nine to twelve months to develop something i mean if we're getting desperate as i think we are um maybe rationing would be an option that we need to look at sooner so madam mayor uh councilman Murillo, um, I feel like the tools that we currently have and, and was adopted by this council in 2011 provide us quite a bit of flexibility going forward to um, further push conservation if we need to, if we need to go there. The, the challenges that, that we see when you go to rationing is rationing um, has this effect of increasing the cost to the lower users. 
It has, right now, you do have a few big users who are paying a lot of money for water, and it's kind of, in general, keeping the costs of water down for your lower 4-HCF, lower users. If you go to this rationing, you're really right. going to force them down into the smaller area, um, which is the goal of rationing, hmm. but you do it in a, in a way that really puts a lot of burden and costs on, on the lower users. And it is a method, I'm not saying it isn't a method, that works, but I'm saying that for our community, we have, um, because of our ability to purchase water and because of desal, we have the ability to um, increase the costs of our water. What, the, what some of the challenges are with communities like Santa Cruz, they don't have access to any of those additional water supplies. So in accordance with Prop 218, they can't just raise their rates because they want to encourage. So that's why they have to go to rationing. Um, for our community, we have these other supplies at our fingertips that cost a lot more money, and that can be that can help drive down water usage through rates, new rates that support those those additional supplies. So what I hear you saying is is that there's a in, in encouraging more conservation on the part of our water customers is sort of a baby step toward rationing, right? Well, that's what I heard. <laughs> and um, I, I wish people were saving more water. I really appreciate, you know, the 25%. Um, I'd like to continue to explore how to get people to use less water. Thanks. Mr. Hart? Well, I, I'm encouraged that people are saving water. Now, so I'm looking at the glass half full. <laughs> um, you know, 25% is if we're moving exactly... We're, in fact, we're past where the target that we had, and we're, we haven't met the target for the year because we weren't there initially. But I think what's happening is people are getting they're, they're getting the bills and they're making changes. And they're, and I think as they continue to get those bills, they're going to continue to make changes. So I'm I'm optimistic that we're going to see more conservation that's just happening as a result of these rates. And we'll have to monitor it and see. Um, you know, I think Ms. Hag, Mr. Hagmark mentioned that. It's, it gets more challenging as people's guards gets more stressed and people have a tendency to want to save stuff. And so that, that is a challenge, but we're going to see. Another reason for rationing is if we have a problem with people who are just to have money and don't, are not as sensitive about prices and are using water and just paying for it. And that is, I understand that that helps, you know, kind of the cross subsidy of, um, lower income people and that's important to to know that and understand that but some of the other jurisdictions in the area have have are struggling with people who are just paying and, and in fact Montecito that's one of the reasons why they said we're not going to let people do that we're going to put a flow restrictor on you at a certain month and that's why they're rationing one of the reasons why they're rationing so the question for me is do we have any customers like that that are kind of insensitive to price and are not really towing the line and, and is that you know, undoubtedly we have some, but is that a big problem? Is that something we should be concerned about? Is that something that you're monitoring carefully? You know, so because I don't want to hear at some point, you know, that 10% of the water in the city is being used by 10 customers and they don't care. And so that's, I, I really want to know the answer to that. Yeah, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Hart, it is a great question and something we have been looking at and reached out to some of our larger users. Um, they don't it doesn't account for a significant portion of our system. And that's, you know, what we've stayed focused on and looking at the different categories of users. Certainly there's people that use a lot of water and, and um, they're paying a lot of money for it right now and, and allowing us to, 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 to deliver water for everybody else for, a, for a, a slightly better price. But in the big picture, they're not significant. They're not, okay. uh, it doesn't represent the same issue that Montecito had and has and is working through. And kind of the counterbalance, I think it's important to understand, too. They've gone, the, the communities that have gone to this kind of rationing are now, as Montecito is, they're now in, in getting into trouble because people are now, have reduced their water usage. So now they don't have the, they're not paying the penalties anymore, and now they have an income issue. So they're scrambling now to try and go through the Prop 218 to get in place the rates to now support that. So I feel ours, our approach keeps us from having to do that. And Santa Cruz is scrambling right now to get rates in place now to support that, that reduction in water usage that they're seeing. So it kind of, um, I feel that the path that we're on, uh, the path chosen by this council is really the most prudent for this community at this time. And, and I think we're, we have not exhausted the tools in our toolbox should we need to 
ask for additional conservation should conditions something change. Another complexity to rationing is, you know, household size. And, you know, you can do that. You can have a mechanism, I think, to address that. But but that gets very complicated. And um, I'm not sure that that is a good idea. Um, just because, you know, if you allocate a certain amount of water per household, somebody that has one person gets to waste water outside. Somebody that has five kids, you know, doesn't have enough water for internal use. So that's, I think that's one of the reasons why philosophically we haven't gone there. Um, and, and I think that's part of the consideration as well. I, I had a question um, asked of me that I think you answered a while ago, but I just couldn't remember, so I'll ask it again. And I know it's not just our decision to make, but it has to do with Lake Kachuma. Um, and the question was, why, what's, why are we not dredging part of the bottom of Lake Kachuma, considering that it's at its lowest rate, you know, lowest level in many years, in terms of future planning for increased capacity when it rains again? And I know there's a complicated answer, but I just, or maybe there isn't. Um, could you remind me what that answer is, though? That's a great. Madam Mayor, uh, the Board of Supervisors have, has actually um, awarded a contract for $500,000 to look countywide at uh, options for um, increasing our water supply or going forward. That's something that they're looking at. That will certainly be one of the options that they look at. And and we've looked at that as well for Gibraltar, but the cost benefit of that is is a significant it I'm trying to remember the numbers. It's like hundred and forty truckloads per acre foot of soil removed. It's significant. And right. so the environmental costs, the just the um the, the the economic cost of moving that soil is is, is really pricey. So that sounds like something looking longer term beyond this drought as we get into further discussion with the desal plant um, beyond the emergency need for it of that kind of cost benefit analysis for us uh, that so that I just want to keep that in mind and what if if Lake Kachuma were to be dredged or whatever the right I guess the right term is um, who who makes that decision is that is that comb? Is that the county? Uh, what? Who's the permitting agency? What? How does that work? Do you know, Madam Mayor? It's, it is a complicated relationship. The Bureau of Reclamation owns and operates, um, well, owns the reservoir. Comb, Kachuma Operation Management, kind of manages it on behalf of all the member participants, and so it would be a. Um, it would be a negotiation that we would get into, but I would guess the federal government would have to take the lead with that. I, I, that would be a significant project, and so I would imagine, um, I, I, I don't know, maybe uh, Ms. Dyer can... I just I wanted to also add that I mean, the, the purpose for dredging would be to increase the storage capacity, and typically um, any agency that's looked at this has um, found it to be more cost-effective to raise the dam rather than than dredging. And so it really is very cost prohibitive to do dredging and, and um, finding out where you're going to put the, the dredge material tends to be problematic. So raise the ceiling rather than lower the floor in terms of just <laughs> trying to picture. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that reminder. I know it's complicated. We do have some public comment speaker slips here. We'll start with Phil Walker to be followed by Mike Jordan and then Ethan Shankman. <coughs> Yeah, if I were uh, came back as William Mulholland, as you all well know, the the grandfather of the LA water system, I'd just do it, run a HDPE pipe down the banks of Mission Creek all the way to the ocean, put the sand, you know, where it wanted to go. But you, you can't do that today. Uh, you know, if you search the California Data Exchange website, it's it's of concern especially the Sierra reservoirs are a lot of them from Tahoe down and even above that are, you know, Oroville's, the main state water res supply reservoirs down to uh, below 30% right now. Same with Lake Shasta, it's down 30% or going south of that. And the thing that uh, really caught my eye, I remember, was the San Luis Reservoir, the main north-south regulating reservoir on the uh, California water aqueduct system, is they're drawing it down, essentially mining it to uh, it's down to 20% of capacity. So 
things go south real bad, I can see some restrictions, uh, declaration of a more severe emergency, limiting water supply and transfer availability. Uh, my concern I wanted to speak about very briefly is the loss of the historical trees, the stone pines on especially Anapamu. I was at, this is interesting, De La Vina and uh, Mission Street. A couple doors up from that is the Braley Institute. I looked over, I did one of these. There's a huge Monterey pine. It, it's, it's gone, and it's amazing, you know, the size of that tree. But uh, trees are starting to go lickety-split, and the, hopefully the city parks department, city arborist Tim Downey, can work with the property owners of, and get some water on their front lines to try to preserve some of these trees. Thank you very much. Mike Jordan. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I just have three or four quick points that I hope you'll include in the discussion. And one is that I think you'd find uh, great support for just deciding to plan and pursue for continual use of desal going forward. When you're talking about rates and motivations just a minute ago, I, I think you would find that most people would just as soon pay more for an adequate amount of water rather than pay more for less water than they can use. Um, whether that's in conjunction with just ourselves, with neighboring communities, whatever that relationship looks like, I think that should be the plan. If you just took 25,000 water meters and the, um, the $5 million dollar, dollar amount you're, that's being bandied about for annual operating costs, that's 16 bucks a month. Okay, I know it wouldn't be that simple when you're figuring it out, but certainly I wouldn't go to a movie every month just to, carry the oper just to help carry the operating costs of desal going forward. Along with that, I've been really frustrated at the lack of, uh, lack of discussion points on both the increased production and use of recycled water. Again, whether it's just for us or for neighboring communities. I probably have my numbers off a little because they're pre-drought and Joshua can tell you better. But we, we generally put out about 12 million gallons of water a day in drinking water out of Cater. By the time it gets down to LS Taro, it's 8 million gallons. So 4 million has gone off somewhere else, not down into the system. Of that, in good times, we can recycle a million and a half or two million gallons for reuse, which means we put six million gallons of water a day out into the ocean. That's six million gallons of water a day that we paid for, paid to transport here, treated, got us down to the customer, and then we throw away into the ocean. It's clear that in the future, we'll have a lot of trouble finding water to buy and transport to us while at the same time we're throwing gallons away out into the ocean, and we need to find a better way to use that water. It also have, of course, the, uh, the side benefit of, of just stopping the discharges out into the, uh, into the ocean of treatment water. And then finally, um, there's a lot of chatter in the background at Planning Commission, as I'm sure there are at the other design boards, on the contradictions between the steps collectively I'm being asked to take in letting my landscape die, putting buckets in the shower for my fruit trees, uh, cutting back on lawns, while at the same time we're, we're not taking any steps at all to look at new development and the net increase in water use. For example, just a couple, several weeks ago, we looked at a four-story project review that had several hundred new toilets and bathrooms in the funk zone. Not a talk at that time over what the water use implications and the net gain were going to be as, go, as going forward as part of that project review. But at the same time, the community is being put under additional pressure to reduce the water to levels that actually sees their existing assets go away. So I would encourage you to, to take some steps there to address that also, as I, I think it's well past the time we should. Thank you. Thank you. Ethan Shankman. Hi, I just want to make a quick reference in regards to the water, um, the bird bath water fountains that we have throughout the city that are on both private and property, uh, private properties and um, public spaces. And it seems to me that due to evaporation control, if I'm not mistaken, is the reason why we have these fountains empty. And I don't know with all the statistics what impact or what an environmental impact report could provide for any kind of climate or 
area region where birds would not otherwise be able to get clean. We've been worried about um, Nile viruses and other type of communicable diseases that could be traveled by birds, insects on birds, what have you. And it seems once again that um, a hygienic and a, and, a, and a domestic safety control should be reevaluated for these water fountains since it's really not making any real impact other than putting us at risk by not having them um, operating. And I'm talking about the bird bath water fountains, in, uh, including the library, the courthouse. Uh, you know, there are private properties that have basically depleted. I think the only um, fountain that's actually going right now is at the Laracata Plaza for the turtles that I can think of. And it's like a vortex over there. You can literally feel it. It's just like, whoa. <laughs> So maybe if we could re-evaluate our policy and let people start running those again, since the awareness of water shortage has already been um, met. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the public comment. Can you um, just remind us with the regulations? We did not uh, pro we, we are still allowing water fountains, private property fountains, bird baths. That's not prohibited anymore, unless it's a certain capacity. Is that correct? They're allowed on residential properties. On residential properties, but not public properties, unless there's already turtles and stuff and, and koi in there. We're not killing the fish or the turtles. Certain size. Yeah. Uh, the fountains, if they are larger than 25 square feet in water surface area, those are the ones that need to be turned off. So a lot of the smaller fountains, whether they're on commercial properties or not, are still on, as well as any residential ones. So even just a residential bird bath is uh, a water feature. It's not necessarily a running fountain, but those can still remain on. It's just those very large ones that have been turned off. Okay. And so, thank you. So we'll get to comments, and I just want to, before, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. White. Um, last week at the joint meeting between the council and uh, the planning commission, uh, I agree with, Ms. with Commissioner Jordan about design review and looking at our landscape design guidelines and suggested at that point, maybe at our next six month review to have that kind of conversation. But perhaps even as we talk about the third stage drought regulations, we need to bring in community development and bring in our design review team for those kind of discussions, which might have a longer term effect um, for water conservation. Um, as Mr. Hart was saying, the last drought, we did the internal structural things, the toilets, the washing machines, the dishwashers, and so forth. Maybe this drought will remind us how, what can we do in terms of our own regulations and policies regarding outside and irrigation. Um, but it, it is a, I, I agree, there's kind of a counter, you know, you want things, you have new projects going through a design review process that, that uh, the, those guidelines have not really changed as much and maybe we should take a fresh look at them and have your department and community development work together on that um, and stage three might be a good timing to do that so those would be my comments for now mr white thank you madam mayor um well this is a really good uh, update today i thought it would, the staff did an excellent job of of uh, bringing us and the community uh, up to date on on where we are and i particularly appreciate the uh, the comments about about what's happening in Kachuma uh, and also uh, going forward, I'd still think this, as you say, there's some more to be done. Perhaps, and every month, I'm sure we'll get more information on what's going to be our share left next year. Again, as these at least another year out, uh, and then what's <coughs> what downstream releasers are getting, et cetera. Just so, what is our share uh, going forward? Is is clearly an important uh, piece of that, but I, I thought this was the best um, <clears throat> summary of of, of of the status of Kachuma uh, that, that we've had so far, and also the the uh, water purchases and the and the um, what we bought and what we can buy going forward. Again, that conversation is one that we just we we. You, you did a much better job today in providing that, and I, I know I appreciate hearing month in and month out uh, just where we are uh, on, on that issue, and uh, I'll be continuing to ask questions about that. Uh, on, the, on the water rate uh, issue, I, I still want to uh, make sure that as we're going forward with this water rate uh, uh, analysis that we have as our extreme end, the full cost recovery uh, option, uh, 
uh, for not just de the desal option, but all just the, the, the full proverbial Monty of, of costs to at least have it as, a, as an extreme uh, option for pricing going forward. Um, and I, one thing, perhaps, if do you have a slide that has the amount of block three? You, you've now, the last couple of uh, sessions, I've seen that slide that shows uh, you don't have that with you. Okay, well, there's uh, maybe next time bring that along um, if you can. Um, I think it starts to show we've had a couple of comments by uh, council members today about the, uh, that right there. Um, yeah, and that shows that block three is that green? Uh, no. That's correct. Uh, Commissioner White, the, the green lines, uh, you'll be looking at 2013. Tier three. Tier yeah, three. that's the tier three users. And it looks to be uh, and that's approximately for, 100 acre feet used in that category for the month of July. Okay, so and roughly uh, a quarter of the use or a little less, 20% of the use is in tier three. Mm -hmm. So that kind of speaks a little bit. It's, it's not totally where Mr. Hart was going with who are the big, you know, big users, but that's, the, that's at least the, the high end users. And you do see a pretty good drop there uh, well, at least from 2013, but um, that's that's an area where we'd be looking at, as particularly if you go into to, uh, stage three, uh, that's where we're we're going to be uh, hoping to at least gain to, to reduce use uh, some amount. And and just as a hearkening back, we're talking about the the the, the last drought. In the last drought, tier three was. Um, well, how much is tier three now? Is it per unit? Is it I believe it's around thirteen dollars a unit. Thirteen dollars a unit. So in in that, uh, as I recall, uh, in nineteen ninety, I think it was twenty seven dollars, and that of course was twenty seven dollars was the equivalent of forty two dollars today or something like that. So we had a, and it was just done. It was literally a number picked. Uh, it, it was just. <coughs> proverbially picked out of the air, but uh, that was, was an important uh, uh, limit on, on what people uh, spent on, on water in those days. Uh, another, cup, another point I want to make is, is groundwater. Is, uh, I, I'm concerned, for example, that folks could um, drill wells, in particular in Basin 1, uh, as, 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 as water gets more expensive. The city does not have a, a, a ban on, on uh, wells, and we at least need to get started on a, on a ground. I mean, obviously, we've got so many water things going on. All we need is one more uh, set of uh, studies and stuff to do. But we do need a policy base, uh, ground, and I know the state is finally getting around to doing something on a statewide basis, but clearly this city needs to have uh, strong control over in particular Basin 1, but really uh, all of our groundwater resources. And uh, we see problems in, in our Foothill Basin related to sort of a, a little bit of a frontier approach and some kind of irrational water, rate, water laws there. But um, we just need a, 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 a more sensible uh, policy around groundwater. And in particular, as I say, I, I see no reason for uh, people to be able to drill wells in, uh, in particular, in Basin One. I thought Mr. Jordan's all of Mr. Jordan's points were were good ones. Uh, the the, the desal, you know, that the number ongoing uh, looks uh, reasonable, uh, and that the reclaim there's got to be some more potential for reclaim above the the thousand acre feet uh, per year that that we can use now. Uh, and uh, appreciate the mayor's comments about. Uh, let's have a look at that, uh, uh, that, what the impacts of new development are and how we want to minimize those impacts uh, going forward. We don't want to shut off the, the, the new development uh, options. I mean, for example, there are many projects that are coming forward that they're actually using less water than, than, the, than the existing use on the site. Well, that's, that shouldn't... Uh, that shouldn't uh, that, that should be allowed to go forward, but it needs to be something that everyone feels is fair, is fair, because uh, we're all tightening down in a whole bunch of different ways, and we're all trying to have a, a sense of, 
of this being a, a, a just system going forward. So I think having that transparency, talking about it, and, and then uh, being able to frame for ourselves and for our community uh, the impacts of, of, of that of the develop of new development uh, proposals is is appropriate for this city to be talking about ongoing. Thank you, and obviously it's heartening that we're seeing a uh, a reduction in use. That uh, was, it surprised me. I frankly was concerned that we weren't going to get there. Finally, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Murillo's comments uh, worries about the future. Sort of my uh, at least really quick uh, calculations say that. We, can, we could have, in the worst possible case, we have 7,000 acre feet of desal in a couple of years if, we just, if it doesn't rain. And we have a pipe that allows us to buy uh, water from the rest of the state to the tune of 3,000 acre feet a year. Is that correct? So 10,000 acre feet of water is our uh, lifeline quantity, which is uh, kind of a ballpark number for what we hope to use in our in our tight drought numbers, those are I mean that's a survival number of water for for this city, obviously with with sacrifices being made. So I, I, that would involve policy changes all over the state. But I think as we as we uh, as the reality hits, 80 percent of the water in the state is used for agriculture. Uh, there's water <laughs> used for irrigated pasture, alfalfa, rice, cotton. All kinds of crops that are, uh, you know, not not as high value, and, and obviously our urban system will be will will need to get some strong attention should the drought uh, continue. So, I feel optimistic that as long as the desal and that pipe is there, that that the city can, uh, uh, you know, weather uh, a long-term drought. Thank you. The governor either today or yesterday just signed a bill about groundwater basin regulations and so perhaps at the next um, update you can tell us how that affects us and what other things we may need to do or if it's just you know how, how that how that all fits in the bigger puzzle that would be helpful uh, mr. Hotchkiss and then mr. Hart thank you madam mayor how expensive is it to drill a private well madam mayor council member Hodgkiss. A uh, private well is probably about $25,000 to drill a well, and that's probably under normal times. I don't know what the well, well is going for these days, but somewhere in there. Prohibitive, I think we could say. It's pretty pricey. It's pretty pricey, yeah. Am I correct in saying we're trying to hit a sweet spot of saving enough water but not too much? Because if we save too much, we're going to have to boost rates because we don't have enough in the uh, enterprise fund to make our system continue running without exhausting reserves? I think there's always a fine line there. Um, I think at this point I'm, I'm less focused on the financial aspect of it and more focused on getting the conservation. Once we're there, we can kind of figure out what the finances need to be to support that level of conservation. Okay, but that is a part of the formula, is Ab it not? Absolutely. You know, okay. we're, we're looking into it and we, we um, are monitoring it closely to make sure that we don't find ourselves in some financial situation that we got to take out of. Mr. Hart? Well, I just want to echo um, Councilmember White's Congratulations to staff. This has really been the best presentation that we've seen. But I think more importantly, the fact that we're doing this so regularly, you know, if somebody's watching on a regular basis, they really understand this issue in a, in a very comprehensive way because you're doing a great job cumulatively of adding to the information people have. And, you know, as, as we ask questions, you bring back more information. So I, I think that, you know, the public and, and the media that are here following this, you know, really can't leave here without really having a very clear, transparent understanding of where, where the city is. And what it really speaks to is the, the long-range planning that's been going on for a very, very long time. This is not ad hoc. This is implementing a plan that was established long before there was a drought, and it was very thoughtfully considered, and we're just we're going through the steps incrementally, and as the, the severity of the situation gets more intense, we have planned for the next step and the next response, and, and a lot of the things we're talking about today are part of stage three. You know, what do we, what do, we do when we get to that stage? And, and this has been thought about, and there's a plan, and we're going we're gonna to be ready to implement that. And there will obviously be some choices at that stage, but it's not going to be reinventing the wheel. And, and the best example, I think, it is, is the conversation about development. And that, that is, you know, in, intuitively, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, why are we letting people build new things? Well, the reason is because more often than not, that new thing uses less water than the old thing. And that's hard to explain. 
it isn't intuitive, but it's, you know, it's very technical and fact-based. And I think that, that it's easy to point at that and say we shouldn't be doing that. But I think, you know, giving us information about that and explaining that in a very precise way is very helpful, particularly, as the mayor mentioned, in regards to outdoor um, landscaping, because we do have different standards. And we are asking, particularly with commercial development, to do very different outdoor landscaping than wasn't the case in the past. And that, that is why commercial development can be net um, less water use than it was in the past. Um, I guess I have a question for um, the city attorney about our ability, legal ability, to regulate private wells. And, and yes, the state has passed very, very, very modest regulations of groundwater. And, you know, that's understandable. The, 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 the ridiculousness of the state regulatory framework for groundwater is, is something that was based on miners, you know, diverting rivers to do mining and then begin getting water rights from that point in the 1850s and having that carry forward through makes absolutely no sense. None of this makes any sense, really, when you step back from it and look at almonds and pistachio growers that are use more waters than use more water than San Diego and Los Angeles combined for residential use. So none of this makes any sense. But it's you know the state in its own slow way is is incrementally moving forward and regulating um, groundwater. But does the city even have the legal ability to prohibit? I mean, is our water basin adjudicated? Can we say no to something like it's that? It's not adjudicated to my knowledge, but the city has the inherent police power to regulate the use of groundwater within its borders. It hasn't been done very much. It's more often been done by counties, and there are a couple of cases upholding counties' ability to regulate groundwater use. The most common regulation I've seen for cities is what I would characterize as an anti-paralleling law that says basically if you're going to take city water, you can't have a well as well. And the motivation traditionally for that was to prevent cost bypass on the system. Um, but you clearly have the authority to regulate groundwater in time of drought. Okay. That's good to know. I'd add one last thing I wanted to mention in regards to the groundwater legislation the governor signed. When our local basins make it to the priority list. They're not there yet, as far as I can tell from Bulletin 118. The city will have the ability to step in and become the Zancaro, so to speak, for the basin and uh, the water master for the basin and be a, a, a controlling regulator. So that's something we'll brief further with the staff and come back to you on. Good. And then just finally, I know um, Councilmember White mentioned uh, having the 218 top tier uh, modeling fee include full cost recovery. I agree with that too. I think that makes sense. This is the moment when people are prepared to pay, you know, a little more to make sure that we're fully funding all of our options. And so I'm supportive of that, it's that as well. Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, <clears throat> obviously the results or the current trends are good as far as our citizens and our water usage goes. I, I think there's a lot of that that has to do with the rate structure. A lot of it has to do with the promotion from staff. But I also think this community, I, I still have faith in the kind of the esprit de corps of this community to, to, to do things in a cohesive way to come together and realize that we do have a common problem. And I do believe in our ability to adjust in that manner. Um, the comments that Mr. Jordan have, I think, kind of rang, rang home with me because I remember asking many of these questions during the initial analysis of Plan Santa Barbara and all the density infill we had talked about at the time. And I asked the question then, do we have the infrastructure both in supply, transfer, and wastewater uh, capacity along with our recycled water, reclaimed water, to, to have this entire plan go forward? And I was told at the time, well, yes, we do. I was told by the folks that, that sat on the different water commissions and whatnot. I wonder if I asked that same question today, if I would get the exact same answer. And I'm not really sure. And I'm asking this kind of rhetorical. I, I, don't, I don't have an answer. But I wonder if we should not, going forward, um, have some kind of methodology to look at these uses, because I know whatever the customer tier graph says, and it's about outdoor landscaping, it's about single family residents. So I, I have to go with the graph, but there's something that's anecdotally sensical about looking at when you have a, a building with 40, 40 bathrooms and showers and toilets, there's going to be a use, there's going to be an impact. And given our current situation and given our infrastructure, 
going forward, uh, we should maybe take a cautionary look at some of these projects. Thank you. Ms. Maria. Thank you, Mayor Schneider. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so I have concerns about using a uh, D-cell. Um, and when, the, when we first started talking about it, um, there was a much lower acre, acre feet figure that we were talking about. And now we're talking about uh, 7,500, right, acre feet. And I'm looking at the, um, the graph here, and it looks like um, that in the year 2017, we're going to be counting on a whole lot of, of D-cell water. And I would just you know, like to, to say that I, we should, I think we should go more slowly on that. Uh, D-cell is going to use a whole lot of energy. And um, if there will be impacts to the, uh, the ocean environment, especially if we go forward with the open water intake. So the more water we take in, you know, the more fish that we're, that we're going to harm. So I, I, I get it um, that we're in a desperate situation. Um, it, I would just prefer to see conservation as, as a way to, to make up for, the, for those gaps. And as such, I, I do support um, Part B of the staff's recommendation uh, in terms of this um, increase in, in funds. Um, just going on record that we should be very, go very slow on, on D-cell. There's a lot of impacts <clears throat> to it. Um, so I move a staff recommendation, A and B. Is there a second? Okay, moved and seconded. Any other comments? We'll have a big uh, conversation about D-cell next week. So for all those listening and wanting to tune in, tune in same time, same channel next week. Uh, thank you again for an excellent report. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you.